Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Katie Hazard. I am your host, and I am Burning Man's Associate Director of Art Management, which means that I'm the head of the art department. And I'm delighted to be here together with you today to welcome you to Art Speaks. Um, I just have to say, like, what an amazing and historic day today has been. Like, such a such a moving and momentous occasion, having a new um, leadership in the White House and. I don't want to presume that we're all of the same political views here, but I do see so many people feeling hopeful and inspired for the first time in a while. So I just want to share that, you know, it feels so good to be optimistic. Um, and so riding on that momentum and inspiration, here we are at Art Speaks. This program is also about encouragement and optimism, stories about people coming together to creatively build something new, to change things for the better. Um, if you're new to Art Speaks, this is Burning Man Project's artist storytelling series that we just launched last summer. And we've been having a great time with these so far, getting lots of good feedback, um, and we're loving having this opportunity to showcase these exceptional Burning Man artists. So I see a bunch of people are already there in the chat, um, but please, as you're joining in, feel free to pop in a hello, say where you're calling in from. I know we're all probably kind of over Zoom at this stage, but you know it still strikes me as being very cool that we can come together from so many different places. So um, it's fun. It's it's nice for us to get to see you know all one another to see like who's here and where are you from. So thanks for adding in your voice. Uh, a couple tips about Zoom, um, which you probably already know by now this far into using Zoom, but I'll just say again, um, please we encourage you to use the chat as much as you'd like to. It's a really nice way for for you to stay engaged. Um, ways to, you know, you can cheer on the artists, that kind of thing. If you have particular questions from the artists, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So that's a good place to pop in specific questions so they don't get lost in, in all the chat. So today's program, how is it gonna go? Um, similar format to how we always do, we've got um, three special guests with us today. They each have a video that's about five minutes long. So we'll go through all of those. We have a special co-host that I will introduce in just a moment. Um, and then at the end, we'll open it up to Q&A for, for, for all of you to have the chance to ask your questions of the artists. So get your questions lined up and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can during that Q&A period. So our special co-host today, I wanna introduce uh, my dear friend and colleague, Dave X. Dave's been going to Burning Man since 1992. Yes, really, 1992. Um, he started off creating large fire art installations. Um, but then by 1999, he saw that lots of people were bringing all kinds of fire art and it had kind of reached a, a tipping point. And so he founded the Fire Art Safety Team. The acronym for that is FAST, Fire Art Safety Team, um, which he still manages to this day. So I'm super excited to have him here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Dave X. Hey, everybody. Uh, glad you made it to this episode of uh, Art Speaks. Hey, first, we're going to do a little quiz here. Get ready to type into your uh, chat box. Uh, what is the first word of the event? Go ahead, type it in there. I'm waiting to see who gets the first right answer. Burning. <laughs> That's right. We're called Burning Man. So obviously, there is a lot of fire involved in our event. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, we've already done an episode about flame effects. In this episode, we're going to talk about open fire. And when I say open fire, we're referring to projects that were built of wood and built to burn, or they're a burn barrel, or they have a burn barrel in their project, or they're a campfire, or as simple as uh, can candles on a piece. But primarily during this episode, we're going to talk about art projects that were made of wood and were built to uh, be burned. And mankind has a long history with gathering around fires. If you think about it, it, it has always meant safety to gather around it and meant warmth to gather around it. It was light in the middle of the night. When you start cooking food on it, those smells of food are just so intriguing and they draw you in. And everybody knows what to do at a campfire. You kind of go up to it and stand around. Well, once you have stood around the fire for a while, you end up talking to the people who are next to you and, and that fire tends to become the center point that man is used to, to turning to their neighbors at a fire and, and talking about whatever subjects come up, to tell stories, to sing songs. It's a place to uh, meet and plan 
it's kind of the center community building space in any community going back, you know, hundreds of years. And then even in modern times, it's no coincidence that the hearth or the fireplace is the center of, of our modern houses. And our, at our event, you could see the effects of this, uh, of the fires building community in macro ways, such as projects like the Circle of Regional Effigies, where we were burned up to 34, 25 foot tall wooden projects simultaneously. Each one of those projects then nurtured a community that built it from different regional groups. And those groups that formed to build that piece of art and to to burn it because there's a lot of people involved in building and then performing a perimeter and all the things involved in burning it then have formed communities that went on to create art projects afterwards. And then I think if you look at it at a micro scale, you have projects like the fireside circles built by DA from the resto team where he just sets out cement circles with a stack of firewood next to it that they keep refreshing. So as you're stumbling through the the playa late at night, you stumble across an empty fire pit with seats and some firewood and some kindling ready to go. And you sit down and just engage with whoever comes by the fire or whatever community you brought to that fire. The fire is like a super huge central community building aspect of our, our event. If you look back at the very first Burning Man, that was the simple magic that sparked this entire movement, this entire event was the burning of the man. Larry and, and Jerry James and the others went to the beach. They had some snacks, had a little drinks, and then they lit the wooden man on fire and people came out of the woodwork. They were a small group when they first went to the beach to do that and have the food and stuff. But as soon as they lit the fire, that was an invitation for others to come and to gather. So you can see I, I'm, I've got a lot of thoughts about these open fires and these burns. I think that they're really crucial to the culture of our event. And so tonight we're going to talk with uh, three artists who are going to give us their take on the burning of art at Burning Man and talking about projects that were built to burn. The fir first artist we're going to talk to is Dan Sullivan, the artist who created the Catacoma Veils project a couple of years ago. And uh, Dan, do you want to introduce yourself before we show a short video that you have? Sure. Uh, hey, Dave. Great to be here. Um, I was, uh, I, as you were doing that introduction, I realized that the first burn, first thing I had burned on the playa was a piece for the circle of regional effigies from Boston. So great memories of burning stuff on the playa. Well, thank you, sir. And I think that we got a uh, video. So we're going to go ahead and start the video that you have. My name is Dan Sullivan. I'm an architect based in San Francisco. I was lead artist on Catacomb of Ales. Before that, I was lead architect working with David Best in the Temple of Grace. And before that, I'd done a couple of smaller projects that also burned on the playa. As an artist, I've always been inspired by spaces that enable two key characteristics. The first characteristic is from the experience of the viewer of the completed piece. I'm interested in spaces that use movement to stimulate journeys in the mind. Catacomb was like this since you climbed up the exterior and descended into the interior spaces. The second characteristic arises out of the process of creating the artwork. I believe that the common experience of creation by a large group of people draws people closer, builds strong bonds, and enables vulnerabilities and support networks that can be very healing. Catacomb was an ambition to unify both of these characteristics in an enormous art piece. With a 50,000 square foot footprint and topping out at 80 feet tall, it was a huge collective effort. We started building a Pier 70 in San Francisco, building and stacking modules, and getting them ready to truck to the desert. From the outset, Catacomb was designed to burn. We had to be very conscious to create structural modules that, rather than being solid, contained a lot of open space so that air could circulate around the members and feed the fire that would bring it down. We wanted the main part of the structure to collapse in less than 30 minutes. That meant, among other things, that instead of predominantly heavy timber, we were building up trusses out of lighter wood members.
Something on the plot is sublime. It's something that once you do it, it becomes an addiction. Starting with absolutely nothing. No reference buildings. No straight lines. You build your own kitchen. You cook your own meals. Gonna take you to a place. Time seems to run both impossibly slow and in fast forward. That you never been and every precisely cut piece of wood is torqued and contorted. I'm gonna take you to our place. Everything that fit perfectly in the default world has a mind of its own on the playa. And open up the door. Catacomb was touched by over 200 dedicated, kind, loving, amazing human beings, about 100 of whom made it to the playa. What they achieved was pure magic in how they supported each other and built connections that would never break, building a structure destined to burn. The Catacomb of Vales burned Friday morning at sunrise. This burn was planned and rehearsed by Daryl Fiss, our pyrotechnician and his crew, and meticulously supported by Dave X and the FAST team. We spent the previous day cutting notches into beams and weakening the structure, so that, once it was lit, the half a million pounds of wood would burn to the ground in less than 20 minutes. Which it did. And it was pure, cathartic magic. That was amazing, Dan. And, you know, when I look at that, what I really see is that it's about a lumber yard, an entire lumber yard worth of wood. And I don't think that most human beings get to be by a fire that big, uh, you know, for entertainment value. And I just wondered what your feelings were when you, you know, your crew is a little bit closer than the rest of the, the perimeter there. Uh, what was your feelings to be around such a huge fire? And then how did you feel about then watching all this materials and stuff once it's gone, then your dream was first nothing, it was just in your mind, then it was physical, and then it was gone in an instant. So your impressions of that big burn and then how it felt to watch it transform to nothingness. Yeah, it's um, it's crazy how much wood we burned actually. It, uh, it was, we calculated, so all, all the engineering was done based on the weight of the structure, obviously. and the engineers had it calced at half a million pounds of wood. Um, and I mean, you remember all this, but it, it arrived on 18, 18 wheelers. So it was an 
enormous uh, amount of wood. And yeah, it was it was hot as fuck actually, um, being that being that close to it. Uh, I I can't remember ever having seen a fire that big on the playa. I'm sure that there were um, uh, uh, bigger ones. I remember the 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 heat from the first explosions of burn Wall Street. Um, but it was it was it was actually similar to you know to that that kind of heat. Um, I think from an emotional perspective, the the burn was actually the first time that I had to reflect at all on you know on what we had done. Um, I think you know up like up until that point, I had um, I had felt you know because I had to organize everything in my head. I you know, it was very uh, uh, logistical. And it was the first moment that I had, like where the emotion actually started to, to come through. And I, I mean, that's, that's the power of a fire like that, I think is, is to really sort of like crack open those emotions and, and connect you with some of the most, uh, emotional and primal aspects of who you are. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, just from building the project, you get really raw, you're worn out by the sun, the wind, even before you got there, the effort, the sleepless nights to get it done. And then, you know, during the week, being the host of the project and keeping an eye on it and then preparing for the burn, it's all this rush, rush, rush. And then the burn lights. So you're really vulnerable from being sleep deprived and hunger and in that vulnerable state. And then there's this huge emotional and physical kick of the fire and it is not uncommon and doxy would tell you the same thing to have artists just break down and cry that that's the moments where they collapse and they lean up against the orange cone and you know that's the all the energy is gone at that point and they just need to relax we often remind artists too because once you are done burning a project like that there's some overnight responsibilities you can't just walk away from a, a heap of embers like that and not expect that somebody's going to ride up on a bike in an art car. So we always remind artists that you're going to need a crew to stay overnight and it shouldn't be you. As much as they say, I have, you know, I'll stay up with it all night, I'll do it. Just like you, they're going to collapse at, at the end of it. And because that's the cathartic release. And so these big, big burns are really amazing. And, and uh, Dan, thank you for being with us tonight. And I'm going to call you back for some questions at the end. Great. Thank you, Dave. So uh, next, I, I want to talk to uh, Doxy, and Doxy is the assistant fire safety team manager uh, working with me very closely at Burning Man, and she's in charge of all the art that is to be burned as compared to the flame effects or the pyrotechnic. She's been doing it for a lot of years now, and she does a really good job of it. There's a lot of logistics that go into burning this art properly and then scheduling it so that we could leapfrog equipment across the playa to keep up with all this burning that is the big part of Burning Man here. And we have a team of folks who help folks who are doing burning projects called the Fire Art Safety Team. And uh, I'm going to introduce you to Doxy and she's going to tell you a little bit of work that the Fire Art Safety Team does around the managing of the fire to make sure that it's done safely. Doxy, you wanna say hi, and then we'll show the little video that you have. Hey everybody, uh, Dan Sullivan, CORE was my first project as well. So nice to know that we both started there. And then that led me to not build more art, but to actually go behind the scenes and help Dave X and help all of you artists. It's an honor to be part of the architecture helping you. Yeah, thanks Doxy. And then we're gonna have you back for some questions at the end, but let's take a look at your video about FAST. Hi everybody, this is Doxy from FAST, the fire art safety team at Burning Man. We're always excited to help you burn your art project and we want you to know that we're part of your team. Our goal is to help you navigate what to expect before you get to the other side of the trash fence and once on playa. If you don't know it yet, well, let me tell you. When you're doing an open fire project, you're actually signing up for two projects. You gotta bring it and build it and then you gotta burn it. And if you think about LNT, it's actually a third project. So keep all that in mind. So long before you get to Playa, and even before you begin to fill out your AIQ, there's quite a bit to consider, and much of that information is on the Burning Man website to help you succeed. And more information will come to you from FAST once we know you want to burn. Let's consider open fire guidelines. Here we cover definitions and we talk about acceptable materials, especially what kind of wood you can burn. 
We also cover DG, safety guidelines, perimeters, fuels, hazard mitigation, ignition. We know it doesn't sound like a lot of fun, but it's worth it. Required documentation for level one open fire. This page is where you start to take a lot of notes. This is where you start to think about the burn scenario, burn timeline, required diagrams, emergency safety plans. And remember, we're here to help you through all of this. We know it seems like a lot to take in and we're working to make it easier to digest with infographics and flowcharts. And please know that we appreciate you reading everything we share with you because we created it for you. Free event, there will be many emails and a few phone calls. On Playa, we will have daily check-ins at the fast desk in the artery, and you will be required to have a burn meeting after you've built your project. During all of this communication, we're looking for things that we might've missed and we're looking for things that we can improve. And with all the experience from the FAST members, especially Dave X, there is a ton of knowledge to help make this memorable. And all of us, we're looking at every aspect of your project through the lens of safety. So we're gonna look at things like fuel, be they solid or liquid. We're going to think about if you have too much fuel or not enough fuel. We'll talk about fuel storage. We're going to help you curate your burn. We're going to think about how to hobble it and where to fuel it and explain to you things like why sprayers aren't good for fuel on Playa and anywhere else. We're going to talk about fire extinguishers and we're also going to talk to you about why we have to schedule burns. We do this because overlapping bird times can be a, like a hard on, on the support teams on Playa. It's hard to get around Playa, it takes a long time to get around Playa, navigating at the dark can be hard, and there's a lot of stakeholders who have to get around. So think about ESD, rangers, perimeter support, folks in the artery. Like, trust me, we do our best to make it fair while juggling a lot of things behind the scenes. When we finally get to burning your art project, we will discuss, check, and double check all the things to make sure your team is ready. Long before burn night, we will have talked to you about your burn team and your perimeter team. Remember, your perimeter team is central to your burn and they need to be considered every step of the way. Burn night, that's what we do it for, right? FAST will be there to manage logistics like checking the weather and we know what's going on in the city via having a radio and this is important so we can call in other service departments if necessary. Once we've determined that it's good to fuel and to burn, we will sit and enjoy it with you. And once the piece falls, FAST is gonna determine when we can drop the perimeter and we'll do this by checking in with various departments throughout the city and with Davex. And then we'll get ready to leave you to tend to your ashes overnight. And then you have to get ready for your morning responsibilities of LNT. Remember, FAST is here to help you. We're on your team. And also remember, don't burn it until we get there. As you can see, there's a lot of stuff that goes into there, Doxy, and I really thank you for always doing your work to, to keep this going. And a few things that I thought I'd tell you guys about, like you, you heard Doxy mention the don't use the sprayer. Part of the things that we do in this information gathering, and a lot of people perceive it as being really burdensome, but it, it reveals a lot of crazy stuff that really could save your life if we didn't catch. And one of the things too that we often see is people say, well, I'm gonna use a pump up weed sprayer and I'm gonna spray fuel all over the structure right before the burn. And that's one that me and Doxy catch right away. Now let, let's think this through. If you put a flammable liquid in a pump up pressurized air sprayer, what are you doing? You're pressurizing liquid fuel with oxygen. You've created an explosive atmosphere inside the pump. And that's just the beginning of the fun once you start spraying the fuel on the wood, yeah, maybe half of it's going to go on the wood, but the rest is going to go in a giant cloud of flammable vapor all around you until finally that hippie rides up on a bike smoking a, you know, a, a, a clove cigarette or whatever and says, hey, brother, what are you doing here? And poof, 
all of a sudden everybody's in flame. So these are the kind of scenarios that we walk you through. You also saw Doxy showed the diagram of the road flare in her presentation. So now one of these core projects that we did one year, there are 34 projects and they're supposed to light simultaneously. We gave every one of them a few road flares so that they could put those on the end of the stick. And then at the given moment, we would all then light the road flares, give them a couple minutes to get going, and then we would all simultaneously light the, the project. So I'm up on a giant boom lift, Doxy's running around in a golf cart. We think everything's on target. I give the radio call to go ahead and light your road flares, everybody. And about 30 seconds in, we get a desperate call from one of the core projects. How do you light the road flare? Well, to us, it seemed obvious how you light the road flare and, you know, but again, like this, the logistics here, not everybody knows how to light a road flare. We suddenly realized, so we made an infographic to deal with this. And so a lot of our job is just to educate people on, on the safest methods. Um, gas versus diesel is another big one. You've all been to the campfire where you throw on a little bit of gasoline and you think that, uh, you know, you go, you'll wait a minute and while you're looking for your lighter, then you go over the lighter and it flares up in your face because it's full of vapor. Well, gas is a terrible fuel to light your art project on, on fire with. You want to make sure you're using something low vapor like a diesel fuel, which will, you can put it on and there's a lot of time before the vapors build up. So all this work that the FAST team is doing is just kind of giving out knowledge that we've learned over years mm -hmm. of Burning Man here. And we're just trying to get you to be able to burn your art, but to do it safely and protect the, the safety reputation of the event at the same time. If something bad happens, it's, it's really bad for everybody all the way around. So uh, yeah, it, thank you, Doxy. And I'm going to bring you on again at the questions and answers part uh, to answer questions about FAST. But uh, yeah, thanks for all the work that you do, Doxy. The next artist we're going to bring on here is uh, Antoine Lee with the Solar Shrine Project. This project is a new project that's going to be burned, hopefully, if we're out on the playa this year, it'll be burned this year. It's also going to incorporate flame effects, and it'll get burned at the end of the week. We wanted to bring on Antoine uh, to give us the perspective of an artist who is looking at all the information that me and Doxy and, and the Burning Man provides on the website and uh, talk to them about what it's like to plan for their burn, why they wanted to burn, what the planning is like for their burn. So with uh, no further delay, I'm going to introduce Antoine. Antoine, are you there? Hey, Dave, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, okay. So you're going to be a first time Burning Man artist out there. Uh, how do you feel about burning your art out there? I think I want to go for it. You know, I've been really involved with the regional burns, but never the big burn. So yeah, sure. Ready. Right. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, let's take a look at your video and learn a little bit about your project. Let's okay. show the video. My name is Antoine Lee. I am the lead artist and designer of the Solar Shrine Project. I am a licensed architect and artist practicing in Chicago. As an architect, I have over two decades of experience. I have worked on many large projects that include civic, institutional, residential, healthcare, and commercial types. My father, who passed away two years ago, was a carpenter and contractor and taught me how to build. I've been making art with the regional Burning Man community for several years, and I am interested in installation art as the life cycles can be shorter. Large architectural project cycles can be two to three, three to five, or five to seven years. Not only that, small installation projects can be a catalyst for social change. So, the Solar Shrine is an Afrofuturistic art installation project. It is inspired by the spiritual beliefs and cosmologies of ancient Egypt and Nubia. These two African Allotic cultures believe that the sun was a deity called Ra. Ra had metaphysical powers and was connected to their creation mythologies. This project seeks to educate people from all over the world at Burning Man about the subject of Afrofuturism and the art and architecture from this region of Africa. The Solar Shrine will also serve as a place of healing and as a communal space, which will be activated by artists at the event. The genesis of the Solar Shrine started with an idea to build pop-up pavilions. I wanted to construct them in inner city neighborhoods in Chicago. These structures will be used as transformative portals for people to meditate and deal with the trauma. These would also facilitate engagement with residents in high crime neighborhoods. 
Conversations could be had with artists and activists about the communities they collectively envision for themselves in the future. The Solar Shrine will in part be built by residents from inner city neighbors in Chicago. I also see it as a Chicago prototype of temporary Afrofuturistic architecture. The Solar Shrine consists of a gateway, a shrine, and a smaller monument. The smaller monument holds propane fuel for the flame effects. This project is unique because it was planned from the onset with burning in mind. Structures will be made of lumber framing and skinned with 5 8 inch thick plywood sheathing. Three quarter inch hardwood panels with gold reveals in between will be on top of the sheathing. All non-structural, non-flammable materials such as flame effects, lighting, etc. will be removed. The structures are designed with sufficient holes to allow airflow for fire. The installation will be burned as a level one open fire per safety guidelines. We will close it down on or after Thursday night of the event. Firewood and construction wood scraps will be loaded into the project. This will help with ignition and burning. The installation will be constructed and braced so that it will fall into itself during the burn. Once the perimeter is set and the go for ignition is received, the structures will be ignited with flares. In addition to logistics for bringing this art project to Black Rock City, my team and I have been doing lots of outreach to Chicago neighborhoods and groups. The virtual burn gave us the opportunity to collaborate locally. We engaged artists, musicians, and activists about what type of futures they envision. This is what Afrofuturism is all about. One of our most ambitious collaborations is with house music. Many people do not know that house music originated in Chicago. It was revolutionary as it used African beats and combined them with technology. This genre is a manifestation of Afrofuturism. When it was created in the 1980s in nightclubs, it brought together all races and classes and was open to all sexual preferences. Forms of techno and EDM music are derivations of this genre, and we want to bring Chicago house music to music stages at Burning Man. This installation will be an incubator for the artistic expression of local people of color traveling to Black Rock City. When I was 16 years old, I started studying Buddhism. I see the Solar Shrine as akin to a Buddhist mandala, which is painstakingly made by monks. After meditation and mantras, the mandalas are destroyed by them. Their destruction symbolizes impermanence, which is the nature of life. Fire is a destructive force, but also represents purification simultaneously. So setting the Solar Shrine ablaze at Burning Man is an offering. It will be a way of cleansing past trauma for attendees both historical and immediate. Thanks, that's an awesome uh, video. I had a couple questions after I watched it. Uh, the first one, you know, I was talking about how the fire can form a place, a nexus for the community to start just like building an art project to start. And then I noticed in your video, the picture of a campfire in a front yard and people around it and talking and gathering and it looked like actual community was going on with a fire in the center. Hey, nailed it. H how do you feel about the community building aspect of both the building of your project and then just on a micro level, like when you had that gathering in the yard there, do you feel like that campfire played a part about it? It seems like a campfire is always a seed to gather and start conversations and eating around. Actually, absolutely, you're 100% correct. I mean, um, that was a part of what we did for that event um, was called Building Local Power. And it was, um, it was connected to uh, artist bonfire event. So it's directly tied into the whole idea of communal space around you know, the fire. And um, it was a great event, so. And do you feel like a uh, community is growing around your project? Have you met people that you might not have met and formed bonds with people that you might not have had you not been at the center of this project? A hundred percent. There are people um, who never would have thought about going to Burning Man, especially people of color who really want to go and be a part of it. Like uh, artists, you know, jazz musicians, DJs, things like that, people like that, so. And a lot of support to build a project as well. 
and you, and you need it. You know, I mean, you give up a little bit of of uh, control of the vision of what exactly the project is going to be when you engage with people, but the the amount and the scale of it can grow exponentially, and that's so valuable. And then those relationships you carry on going forward here, and I think that's one of the greatest things about. You know, sometimes if you say you're going to build a giant project just to some random people, I've said this many times before, if you went into a bar and said, I'm going to build a giant whale and all my friends are going to ride around in it and it's going to have a disco and shoot fire out of the top, you, you know, you're pretty much laughed out of the bar. But if you attach the phrase for Burning Man to that, suddenly people have a reference for impossible things being done. And all of a sudden your idea doesn't seem crazy. The person on the next bar stool says, well, I've got some metal, I'll donate the person next to them says, I'm a, I'm a welder. And the next thing you know, you got a welder in your project. And then the dreams are happening because you said that it's for Burning Man and there's a reference for the impossible happening. And then the community starts to coalesce around it. I, I just love that. Absolutely. One other question I wanted to ask you, I was uh, also watching and I saw that your father was referenced in the beginning of the video. Do you have any memories of childhood fires with, with dad? Um, sort of when I was really young, there were some memories out in the backyard, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, a lot of, you know, like building the effigy I was working on, um, King Bernardo was the name of the effigy for uh, Burn Burn, uh, back in, uh, 2019. Um, you know, we did a lot of construction projects together, uh, my father, and my, my father and I, um, even recently, probably within the last 10 years, he died two years ago, so. Yeah, um, yeah, like barbecuing and after barbecuing, we had like, you know, a fire pit or whatnot. <laughs> love that. I love barbecue uh, and fire pit. And, uh, you know, I'll just tell a memory of mine with my son. Uh, I remember when he was maybe nine years old, we were in the woods and we had a little campfire going. And I think this is the first time that I noticed of him in a thoughtful mode. He was sitting by the campfire and he was slowly poking the campfire with the stick you know, kind of as you could do, and you could tell he was thinking, and I said, hey, Cyrus, what are you thinking about? And real thoughtful, he said, well, I'm thinking about my friends and candy. <laughs> and I thought, well, hey, all right. So anyway, I, I just thought I would check on that because I saw that you uh, mentioned your dad, and I think that that's one of those first memories that we have where the kid is out with the dad and making fire and stuff. So um I think with that, um, we're going to start looking at some questions here uh, from Katie Hazard. Um, Katie, are, are you ready to take some questions? I sure am. Thank you. Um, that was a really fun tour through all kinds of fire art. Uh, I just have to say, I remember my first year at Burning Man, it was 2000. Um, I was kind of shocked to see things burning. Like the first thing that I saw, I mean, I knew it was gonna happen, but the first thing I saw, I was like, oh, like, can we be this close? Is this cool? You know, it was like fire had always been a thing to be more afraid of, you know, aside from like a campfire or something like that. So, so it's been cool to watch my relationship with fire change over the years. I bet a lot of you feel the same way that, um, you know, I have a whole different perspective on, on, on fire as an element, you know, there's a lot in there about release and, and purification and change and so um it's very cool thank you all the artists and fast team who has um helped many people experience this change in their relationship with fire so uh yeah let's bring back um all the artists now dan and doxy and antoine and we will jump into some question and answers so um as we've said there's a q a box at the bottom of the screen please feel free to uh drop your questions in there. So I'm going to kick off with the first one. Um, Dan, somebody asked, um, why did you choose to do a, a burn at, at dawn instead of in the evening? Sure. Um, well, it's a, it's a bit of a story about, it's a bit of a story about the piece, wh why we chose uh, the, the dawn. The, the piece was conceived of when I was walking on um, Halloween night, which is a time when in theory the veil between uh, life and the life beyond life uh, is very thin and she had just recently lost her husband and so the, the the theme of the project was really around this notion of like liminality or like the real thinness between um, uh, between life and life and death but also in many other aspects of 
you know, who we are and how we, how we operate in the world. And so to me, um, the, the time before the sun is up, um, while it's still coming up, when it's been night, uh, is also uh, a time of liminality, um, sort of a, you know, a space of, of being between. So that, um, so the, the dawn burn was really, you know, part of the ethos of the piece. So I was muted. <laughs> um, that's so cool. I don't think I ever knew that about the project. And you know, you're right. I love that moment. Um, you know, and everything in life, these these places where you're just on the edge from one thing to the next. But on Playa, especially, it's so magical that time when it's like starting to get light, but the sun's not up yet. You know, there's something so special in that moment. And um, is that also what the reference to veils in the name of the piece is about? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's about that thinness and we're surrounded by thinness and we, you know, we, we wear veils as masks um, uh, to mask our own thinness in, you know, in certain ways. So it's that, that is where the veils are from too. That's a cool thing to explore, especially with some, such a monumental piece that sometimes it's such a fine, you know, you think about veils or the liminality is something so delicate and yet you were able to use something so monumental to convey a concept that is so so kind of fine. It's neat. Thank you. Um, Doxia, if someone has a question for you. How can someone with no experience with fire get involved with FAST or other fire related teams on Playa? My suggestion would be to start it to a regional burn. Regional burns are a great place to learn and you're creating community there. And we also do have um, a mentorship program uh, at Burning Man. And yeah, there's, there's a variety of ways to get in there, but uh, and you can hit me up online and we can chit chat. But uh, definitely start with your regional burns because regional burns are really a magical place. And also volunteering with the uh, perimeter team, the burn perimeter support group is a great place to start because uh, while we don't often have a lot of openings in the fire art safety team, it's a rather small team. We always have tons of openings in the burn perimeter support group. And if you start getting your face in front of us and we start seeing that you're working real hard on the burn perimeter support group, then as we have uh, gaps in the FAST team, we may reach out to you. So that's a great starting place as well. Absolutely. I'm going to um, follow that up with the burn perimeter support team is fantastic and it's their support burns. and. Those teams are dedicated to, they're facing the crowd. They're not looking at the art, but it's, we can't do it without them. So yeah, please start there. Good suggestion. I mean, that leads me to another question. Someone's asking Antoine if he's looking for volunteers. So that may also be a way to, to start getting involved. Antoine, if people want to help, what, what should they do? Yeah, just reach out to me. Um, uh, email address is solashrine.contact at gmail.com. Yeah, we'll be looking for, you know, um, perimeter team members. And then also um, after the fire is ex extinguished, like leave no trace, LNT crews, um, crew members, um, and then potentially some burn team members as well, so. Cool, thank you, okay. that's great. Um, and then a bigger question for you, Antoine, besides just how people can volunteer, um, Pyro Pantera is asking you, what do you think has been the most impactful contribution from your family, friends, or community towards making this project a reality? Well, just the amount of support, especially within the Burning Man community, um, has been like phenomenal. Um, you know, like people who've been to Burning Man, going to Burning Man for years, like my construction manager, Dan Brown, and then uh, Captain Nemo, who does a lot of stuff with like of Fire. He's a like a flame expert, and he's going to be my uh, flame effects uh, lead. Um, just people within the Burning Man community, and also, you know, when we did the when the virtual burn took place, you know, we I wanted to reach out to the community because the genesis of that was basically I wanted to build these structures in the community, like these these places where people can come and gather. And um, some of the people I engaged had never, you know, a few had never heard of Burning Man. And then other ones that basically had heard heard about Burning Man, they were really they really wanted to get more involved, like artists and so um, just amazing support um, out of Chicago. It's, it's been like amazing. That's cool. 
it's cool for you and it's also cool for me to hear that as a story like i love hearing the ways that you know people just see this the, the final product at burning man and they don't know that like all oh, these people were involved in the ways that it changed their life along the whole way so that's super cool i'm glad to hear you're already like building up all that support where you are absolutely um somebody named nexus asked if um they live in dc uh he lives in dc and he wondered if if you need help from afar as well if that's a possibility just reach out to me um there are a whole bunch of things we can do um away um virtually and then also when black rock city when we go to build in the desert too at the same time so most of the installation will be built in chicago um in the warehouse the warehouse that you saw in the video um and then we'll build that in modular pieces and ship them out on semis you know when we get to burning man so there'll be tons of opportunities out there on the playa to be on part of the build team or part of you know um when we're um about to set it on fire and a lot of like pre things you know um in terms of there's a bunch of opportunities communications media all types of things so that's great um a question for dave and doxy uh someone said a lot of non-burners think all of the art gets burned at burning man how many art projects actually do burn every year approximately we average about 14 a year Unless there's like a core and then there's a lot more a core, but they consider core as one project. So yeah, over the last maybe five or six years, it's been 14 to 18. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a lot. <laughs> oh, I mean, each one, like there's so, we could see from your video how much work goes into each one. So mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, out of 400 plus art installations every year, it's it's a smaller percentage than, than a lot of people might assume. Yeah. Um, Dave X, the question for you from John Valentino. Why do all the FAST team members carry clipboards? Is that a cult thing? <laughs> no, our clipboard, clipboard is our uh, badge of authority. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had a fire inspector come over and inspect your place, but the first thing they pull out is the clipboard. And I thought, well, when dealing with government officials, we better have a clipboard. If, if it's not on a clipboard, it's not official. If you don't have a binder or whatever to break open and reference, what do you got? You got nothing really. So the clipboard is the badge of authority that the fast carry. And we try to have a metal one there because as anybody who's ever been on ply knows that if you use a regular just front facing clipboard, it's gonna all those papers are gonna blow off into the wind and you'll be finding them at the at the trash fence. But yeah, I mean it helps us keep our, ourselves organized. We can keep a schedule on it. But without a clipboard, you got nothing. The, the clipboard is the badge of authority. And you can out fire marshal the fire marshal when you pull out your clipboard. I remember in the early years of Burning Man, I had a bunch of papers on the clipboard and we're doing something and the sheriff rolls up and he's like, what in the world are you doing here? And I pulled open the clipboard and I scrolled down. I said, well, look, it's 9 p.m. It's dynamite toss, you know, 9 p.m. right here. It's in the clipboard. And he said, whoa, well. And I clearly had a lot of paperwork in that binder slash clipboard. And he looked at it and he said, well, if it's in your binder, then you know, carry on. So really, it, it's, it gives you the authority. <laughs> Good to know. Now where everyone's going to come up with like their clipboards being like, hey. I'm <laughs> yeah, go on Amazon, get a clipboard. That's my <laughs> suggestion to everybody. It projects cool. authority. <laughs> um, Dan, a question for you. Well, it could also apply to Antoine, but I think let's let's um, let's start with Dan having answered this question. Um, it says, how did being an architect factor into your decision to build something for Burning Man and to burn it? How does impermanence feel to someone who builds permanent structures for a living? Oh, well, that's such a good question. Um, so I think the way that being an architect figured into the decision to build something so large is that as an architect, you're, all of your notions of what big means are just totally distorted. Um, you build huge buildings all the time. So they, so the idea of building something that's 80 feet tall on the playa doesn't actually seem that big. Um, uh, so I think I, maybe the answer is it contributes to the audacity, I guess. Um, and maybe some skills in terms of knowing how to run a project and, you know, knowing how something goes together. Um, <clears throat> I think the impermanence aspect of it is actually really liberating. Like you can't focus on the final outcome 
as the goal. Like it has to be something else. Um, as an example with Catacomb, I mean, the, the structure was epic, the fire was epic, but I wanted the thing that was gonna persist after all that went away. And so I focused on building a community of, you know, of people that, that treated each other well and, and supported each other. And so that, that's the permanent thing. That's, to me, that's the metric of success for that project. Wow, that's a beautiful way to think about it. And how has that gone on? I mean, it's been a couple of years. Like, do you still maintain some of those relationships? Family, oh. family. Yeah, and I mean, in, in pockets of family everywhere, like it, totally independent of me, so. That's neat. I have a couple of good friends that worked on that project and yeah, they still talk about it. I think they're here today. They were like, oh, you know, that's very near and dear to us. I saw them in the video, like, yeah, it's true. That is the lasting part. Thanks. Sure. Antoine, do you have thoughts you wanna share? I mean, I know you haven't actually brought your piece yet, but the, around the ideas of permanence or impermanence. Yeah, I talked about that on the video a little bit, like what impermanence is. And, you know, um, you know, like what Dan was saying as an architect, if you deal with like big projects, the scale is, you know, architects have to deal with on a regular basis is pretty, pretty large. Um, so it's not, a, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary to do a large scale art installation project. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, you know, I wanted, as my, I talked about in my video, to really do a lot of like smaller projects in Chicago, you know, where we could like gather and do different things in the community, do the practice like yoga or something like that, different spiritual, spiritual systems. And those are going to be temporary structures as well. You know, in our communities, we have so many, you know, things happening that, that, that have happened to us historically, like uh, racism and his, and economic disinvestment and blight and a lot, a lot of a lot of those things have caused trauma and I think that's one of the the big things that I wanted to do was set the intention that we want to give that away you know like bring something new into our lives it's almost like a spiritual ritual so um yeah it's really connected with that a lot of it is mm -hmm. you know I've practiced uh, yoga um, for a while at Kundalini Yoga and we would have like these new moon and full moon ceremonies where we would set intentions we would um, we would write down something that we wanted to bring into our lives and something that we wanted to you know uh, take out of our lives and then we would take that those piece, pieces of paper and put them in a the fire so it's really akin to that mm -hmm. The yeah. fire is used in, in many ritual ways, in many ways of fire that we've seen it used at Burning Man, for instance, the fire can be used as a device to actually take wishes and prayers up to the heavens and rises with the smoke and the embers. It could be used in a cleansing way where you, you know, let's say, for example, you write down something that's really been hard for you or your body or something that you want to be cleansed of and the fire cleanses it. It can be used to make offerings, like in, in cultures, they use it to make offerings to ancestors. So it's like a vehicle for transferring that. There's the lighting, the light at, of a candle for making a wish or a prayer. Fire has been used in rituals because of its transformative effects. Again, going back to the campfire and to the earliest ways. So when we're using it at Burning Man as an element of our rituals, it's understood by people who are witnessing it because it's so ancient in, in our beings, you know, to, to use fire for these rituals. There's so many different ways that that element can be used, just like water, just like air and earth. It, it's one of those elemental things that plays into ritual really well. Well said, Dave X. <laughs> well said, thank you. Um, Dave, a question for you. Um, how does all this fit into the Burning Man sustainability plan? How can we continue to burn and still be responsible stewards of the land? Well, look, if we didn't have burning and Burning Man, what are you left with? <laughs> that doesn't sound like much fun. Doesn't sound like much fun. But I will tell you that we've done the math. We've back mathed it on the, the materials that are released in the burning process. And in the grand scale of the event, it's not actually that consequential. We've also 
been trying to keep the amount of burns fairly stable. And this brings us to an interesting point. Over the years now, we've seen this kind of growth of scale of projects of massive scales. And it used to be at, at Burning Man, if you just said that you wanted to burn something, we would arrange a time and a place for you to burn it. But with these really large scale burns, you know, like let's say uh, the windmills or the folly or uh, any of these really, or catacomb of ales, all those require staffing, whether it's the burn perimeter support group, the, the fire, fire uh, ESD folks, and all of their equipment, the medical folks, the rangers. We only have so many of those staff members. We only have so many staff working hours per event. So at this point, we have to kind of curate which of the larger burns we want to have at the event because there's only room for so many in the schedule before we start overloading our staff and, and that becomes unsafe for both the ESD medical arranger and burn perimeter support staff, but also for the participants. So we have to kind of keep an eye on the numbers. So environmentally, we always ask that the artists use the cleanest of wood with no plastic, you know, no, no materials are going to fly off. And we try to burn it as cleanly as possible, but I mean, we are burning stuff. But in the grand scale of the event in, in Nevada and California, it isn't that excessive. And I just want to point out, you could test nuclear weapons in Nevada, so I don't see the problem with burning a 25-foot effigy, personally. <laughs> That's also to say that when we are uh, changing our policy a little bit, that as Dave alluded to, that um, people will have to apply to burn going forward, that it's not just... Um, you know, because like we said, if there's 400 plus art projects and and like Doxy said, we have room to do, you know, 50, 15 to 20 or something per year, um, we need to find start finding ways to, to keep it manageable and sustainable. So. Another thing I think is important is that the artist should have a reason to burn. You know, fire is like ketchup. People want to put fire on everything. And uh, <laughs> but does that mean that it makes whatever you're putting it on taste better? No, it was just an impulse to burn it. And everybody who burn builds a project for Burning Man says impulsively, I, I want to burn it. But you should have a reason just because you don't want to take it apart or take it home or deal with it post event is not actually a really good reason to burn your project because it has environmental implications. The decomposed granite that goes on the ground to protect the ground surface is always hard to remove. So you got to deal with all, all those implications, their safety implications. There's the effort to burn it is often four or five times greater than the effort of just taking it apart with a saw and throwing it in the back of your truck and taking it home. So it's a false assumption that it'll be easier to, to burn it than to clean it up. And so me and Doxy are often trying to talk people out of just burning their trash. You gotta have a reason or a ritual or a path or something to do your, do your burn. I'm not trying to give you like a cheat code of how to get your project approved for burning by saying you gotta have a reason to burn it, but you do, I mean, think about everything that goes into it. Every time we burn a project, it's the rolling of a dice. And the less times we roll the dice, the, the better for everybody is. So yeah, fire is like ketchup. People want to put it on everything, but that doesn't necessarily make it feel, taste any better. So I encourage you to use ketchup sparingly as you apply it to your art. <laughs> And that is Dave X's final advice. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I'm just seeing that we're um, we're at time already for today's episode, so um, we're going to have to close here. But I just want to wind up by um, by thanking everybody. Thanks, especially to today's artists. You know, it takes a special kind of person that wants to play with fire, and we super appreciate all that you've put into your projects that can show us how magical fire can be. So, thank you so much for sharing your stories tonight. Um, thanks Dave X for co-hosting and Doxy and the fire art safety team who helped make impossible dreams come true safely year after year. It's really incredible work you guys do. Thank you so much. Um, and then to all of you, to everyone that joined us here this evening, a uh, big sincere thank you to um, for you for supporting the artists for whatever ways you are finding to keep the fires burning and in your own home or community. So thank you for being here. We um, are gonna share a really short feedback survey. We'll put a link in the chat right now. We'll also send it out in um, an email in a couple of days. We'd love to hear what you think about Art Speaks. Um, we wanna keep making it as good as it can possibly be. So thank you. 
And um, there's more art in your future. We have our next episode of Art Speaks coming up at the end of February. It's going to be on Wednesday, February 24th at noon Pacific this time. Um, and the theme will be dreaming of dust. So we'll hear from a handful of artists who have been continuing to work on their Burning Man artworks all throughout the pandemic, um, dreaming and planning for the time when we can all be back in Black Rock City together. So please join us. The registration will be on Kindling again. And lastly, um, the work our team does year round to support these artists is part of the larger mission of Burning Man Project, which is a nonprofit. So if you feel moved to support us, we would truly appreciate that. Um, please make a donation if today if you can. Um, no gift is too small. Thank you so much for your generosity. And um, we really appreciate your helping us make this work possible that we're doing, keeping, keeping the burning and Burning Man um, bringing back all of the, the blazing glory of Black Rock City. Uh, Donate.burningman.org is where you can do that. So huge thanks again to you for joining. Have a great evening. And that's all. Thanks again to all the artists too. Take care, everybody.